In part six of The Prince, we'll be going over chapters 15 through 19, a collection of rather short chapters relative to the others. Previously, Machiavelli had spent much of the time in The Prince concerned with classifying different types of leaders, different ways of gaining power and military affairs. But this video marks the latter half of his work, which is much more concerned about the general means and methods of ruling for a political head of state, particularly regarding the personal qualities that a leader should or should not develop in order to be effective. Chapter 15 is titled, What Men and Rulers Are Blamed For. On the first page of the chapter, he juxtaposes his realist prescriptions against the more aspirational advice of those who had gone before him. Quote, Many writers have dreamed up republics and kingdoms which bear no resemblance with reality. There is such a gap between how people actually live and how they ought to live that anyone who declines to behave as people do, in order to behave as they should, is schooling himself for catastrophe and had better forget personal security. If you want to play the good man in a world where most people are not good, you'll end up badly. Hence, if a ruler wants to survive, he'll have to learn to stop being good, at least when the occasion demands." End quote. This is a common refrain from Machiavelli, which sets him apart from other political theorists of his day. He hand waves away their aspirations about what society should be, and instead focuses on the realities of the world, the realities of power, and endorses villainy at the tactical level when needed for the preservation of order and to retain power. In this vein, Machiavelli lists a number of vices and virtues and claims the impossibility of a man, especially a ruler, to maintain all of the virtues yet dispense with the vices, as wonderful as that might be. What Machiavelli does instead is suggest that the prince should rather avoid those things that will lead to disgraces, which will undermine his power, and leaving an opening for his authority to be subverted by opportunists. As for those vices which won't risk a prince's power, he should avoid doing them if he can, but otherwise need not worry that infringing on these virtues will cost him his throne. As for a bad reputation associated with certain necessary qualities, like ruthlessness, they are almost essential to hold on to power in a certain sense. In this vein, Machiavelli switches gears to chapter 16, Generosity and Meanness. For a ruler to gain a reputation of generosity, he must be lavish, so as the people on the whole will think of him as generous. Private, anonymous philanthropy will not do when a leader is trying to boost his PR, essentially. However, if he pursues this course too much, he will beggar the kingdom and have to relinquish the generosity or raise taxes on the people, both of which they won't like and the latter they'll hate. We see this even now in modern politics, with politicians getting plenty of mileage by promising generosity in the form of entitlements on behalf of their voters. And once giving, the political capital required to unravel them is virtually unworkable. Unlike the rulers of yore, however, modern political actors have the benefit of fiat currency, uh, an industrialized economy, and access to central banks to help fund their supposed generosities. In his time, Machiavelli wisely called for austerity and noted that the penny-pinching of a prince who doesn't overburden his citizenry with heavy taxes will be seen as prudent and capable by his subjects. He'll be seen as generous by virtue of not taking too much from the people to fund lavish excesses. In the age of hard money, when Machiavelli is writing, the vice of meanness ends up becoming a virtue that helps the prince stay in power. However, if one were seeking power as an outsider, then ginning up the population with promises of generosity could be a tool for acquiring power, as with Julius Caesar on behalf of the populares. But once in power, wanton spending has to be reined in, otherwise the stability of the regime will be shaken. From page 83 of The Prince, quote, A ruler leading his armies and living off plunder, pillage, and extortion is using other people's money, and he had better be generous with it, otherwise his soldiers won't follow him. Was not your own subject can be given away freely. Cyrus did this, so did Caesar and Alexander. Spending other people's money doesn't lower your standing, it raises it. It's only spending your own money that puts you at risk. Nothing consumes itself so much as generosity, because while you practice it, you're losing the wherewithal to go on practicing it. Either you fall into poverty and are despised for it, or to avoid poverty, you become grasping and hateful. Above all else, a king must guard against being despised and hated. Generosity leads to both." End quote. 
Continuing with his theme of public perception, Machiavelli turns to matters of cruelty and compassion in chapter 17. He begins by making the normative claim that every leader would wish to be thought of as compassionate rather than cruel. However, he adds a caveat that a ruler should not use his compassion unwisely. He cites once again, as he did earlier in the Prince, the example of Cesare Borgia. Borgia was thought to be cruel, yet his cruelty, according to Machiavelli, brought order and unity to Romagna, making it a peaceful and loyal domain. Machiavelli adds the following. A ruler mustn't worry about being labeled cruel when it's a question of keeping his subjects loyal and united. Using little exemplary severity, he will prove more compassionate than a leader whose excessive compassion leads to public disorder, muggings, and murder. That kind of trouble tends to harm everyone, while the death sentences that a ruler hands out only affect the individuals involved. But of all rulers, a man new to power simply cannot avoid a reputation for cruelty since a newly conquered state is a very dangerous place." End quote. The prescription of Machiavelli is to avoid being hated by the populace, but when the time comes to strike, better to strike at once hard, swift, and decisively. This is analogous to the perennial wisdom that when conducting a war it is better to be ruthless and violent to end the war quickly, rather than engaging in a protracted, mild-mannered campaign in the effort to be humane. The latter, in the long run, leads to more misery and claims more lives than a swift and ruthless war effort. On the matter of whether it is better to be loved or feared, Machiavelli argues that it is better to be feared. Ideally, a king would prefer both to be loved by his people and feared by his enemies. However, in the execution of justice and maintaining order, a king will necessarily garner a deal of fear among his subjects. For among the unruly and duplicitous, they will not respect a monarch unless they first fear him and his power. As Machiavelli says, quote, We can say this of most people, that they are ungrateful and unreliable. They lie, they fake, they're greedy for cash, and they melt away in the face of danger. So long as you're generous, and as I said before, not in immediate danger, they're on your side. They shed blood for you. They give you their belongings, their lives, their children. But when you need them, they turn their backs on you. The ruler, who has relied entirely on their promises and taking no other precautions, is lost. End quote. As a matter of necessity and because of man's fallen nature, a sovereign must rely on a certain degree of fear among his subordinates, who will do as they're sworn under fear of the king and his justice, when loyalty to him is not enough to quicken their spirits or temper their selfish aspirations. When dealing with the dishonest and unconstant, this leads to the question of whether a ruler should always be honest when surrounded by those who practice in deceit. The advice given by Machiavelli in chapter 18, A Prince and His Promises, is emphatically no. Machiavelli begins a chapter by stating that the reader should bear in mind there are two ways of doing battle, using the law and using force. Use of the law is the domain of men, and force pervades the animal world. However, for a ruler to govern efficiently and preserve his throne, he should draw upon both. Machiavelli lists the archetypes of the fox, uses cunning to thrive, and the lion, who relies on his strength and martial prowess. A good ruler, according to Machiavelli, should aim to strike a balance between the two. Quote, Hence, a sensible leader cannot and must not keep his word, if by doing so he puts himself at risk, and if the reasons that made him give his word in the first place are no longer valid. If all men were good, this would be bad advice, but since they are a sad lot and won't keep their promises to you, you hardly need to keep yours to them." End quote. The rule here with Machiavelli, as in so much of the prince, is pragmatism. It is not advocacy of outright evil for pure self-interests, but tactical dishonesty for the perceived greater good, in a sense. Continuing on page 95, Machiavelli states the following. What you have to understand is that a ruler, especially a ruler new to power, can't always behave in ways that would make people think a man good, because to stay in power he's frequently obliged to act against loyalty, against charity, against humanity, and against religion. What matters is that he is the sort of character that can change tack as luck and circumstances demand, and, as I've already said, stick to the good he can but know how to be bad when the occasion demands." End quote. While a ruler needs to rely on being feared to some extent and can get away with a degree of dishonesty, he must avoid being hated and contemptible. 
as Machiavelli says in chapter 19, avoiding contempt and hatred. The two easiest ways he can become hated is if he takes his subjects women or dispossesses them of their property. In most cases, Machiavelli says, as long as you don't deprive them of their property or honor, most men will be happy enough and you'll only have to watch out for the ambitious few who can easily be reined back in various ways. Apart from seizing property or women, a ruler will be held in contempt if he is seen as changeable, superficial, effeminate, fearful, or indecisive. Instead, a ruler should project greatness, spirit, seriousness, and strength. A ruler with these qualities will be highly thought of, and it's difficult to conspire against such. So long as his reputation for excellence is maintained, along with his respect by the people, it will be hard for an outside enemy to attack him. But, while shielded from the outside, the threat from within remains. But if a ruler is loved and respected by the people, he and his family are buttressed against conspiracy. As an example for this lesson, Machiavelli gives a late Annibale Bentivogli, Duke of Bologna, who was conspired against by the Canescis, who killed him. At this point, the surviving Bentivogli, his son Giovanni, was still a baby. But immediately after the murder, the people rose up and killed the Canescis. This was due to the fact that the Bentivogli were extremely popular. They then selected a Bentivogli from Florence to serve as regent, who did so faithfully till young Giovanni was old enough to rule. In such a situation, were the Bentivogli hated or held in contempt by the public, the coup carried out by the Canescis may have been seen as an act of deliverance rather than unjust usurpation of a legitimate authority. What made the difference for the Bentivogli family is that they had avoided not just being hated but commanded the respect and loyalty of the people of Bologna, who acted on their behalf at a critical time. Even though one be king, he's never home free, and a ruler must always guard against the wiles of nobility or elites within society, who would see him overthrown or dead. But above all else, a ruler must avoid the contempt of his subjects to secure power and maintain stability within the realm. Thank you.